ladies and gentlemen. Hello, everybody out there today. Yeah. All right, as you know, this is, of course, the Buddy Rabbit Poll. Bum, bum, this, bum. Is pod- this is the podcast where we take a theme each and every week. And what we do is we discuss this theme until something that we're discussing sends us off on a tangent. We go down that tangent or a bunny rabbit hole until we get to the end or until Craig finally gets tired of us talking about that and brings us back to the main theme to keep us in topic so these things don't last three and a half fucking hours. <laughs> right. And as Jason said, we do pick a, a central theme every week and we research both sides of it, not just what fits our narrative. But our opinions are also added into this, and so if you're easily offended or anything like that, time to go somewhere else and all the normal shit I usually say here. Yeah. <laughs> and as you know, our opinions are the narratives, so just get used to it. Right. Because this right. is Trump's America. This is America. We're making it better by giving you our opinions. Sorry, I'm turning a light on here. There we go. I can see myself. Oh, hey, there you go. <laughs> light. What is that light? So those of us in video land have finally seen me, and I'm not a silhouette. I'm not a member of the uh, Witness Protection Program. I'm here. I did not get in trouble. Mm-hmm. So, all right. With that being said, what is our theme today? Our theme today is the culture of fear that mm-hmm. is brought wild in America and pretty much all over the world, to tell you the truth. Yes, this is a topic we've been wanting to talk about for a while. It is pertinent today, but as we're going to talk about, it's come to light to a lot of people today. They're finally waking up to the tactics that their current administration is doing. But as you'll see, this has been going on for a long time. Oh, it's been going on for centuries. (laughs) Yeah. So it's one of those things that unless you really look for it, you can really easily get caught up in it. Oh yeah. You know, I, I'll be the first to admit that I got caught up into it um, before the last election cycle. Yeah. But that's simply because I did my own research on Trump and saw what a disaster he would be. And that's coming to fruition. (laughs) Yeah. And we'll, we'll go into him and his his White House us uh, um, on their and we'll we'll do a whole little part on that, but their masters, and I'm not just talking about him. I'm not, I'm not talking about the Republicans. I'm not. I'm talking about the Republicrats because they're all in on this, and it is it's a sad state that uh, we can. Well, okay, here, I'm sorry, I'm free-flowing, not enough coffee in me. <clears throat> for for years, the old adage in advertising has been sex sells. But when it comes to media, it's fear sells. You don't, you may have sexy women and sexy men telling you about the news there, and that may get your eyeballs there, but what gets you to tune in is the fear element. And if you don't understand what I'm talking about, just listen to any lead in for like the 11 o'clock news. And they're like, are your children being poisoned by their toy? At local mall by raging lunatic. Yeah. Or is your drywall slowly eating you? (laughs) Right. And then you're like, well, what? Huh? How can that happen? And then next thing you know, it's 11 o'clock and that hits you. And then it's like, well, shit, how's my drywall eating me? And you turn it over. Right. And it's a marketing ploy. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that too. When we talk about, we're going to go into all this and then we're going to give you some tips and tricks on how to combat it. Exactly. So yeah. um, let, I think we should start out with the, the FDR quote, just, just because the only thing to feel is fear itself. Exactly. Exactly. Um, the I found a great quote, and I know you've seen it too because we we watched the same YouTube video. But at the very end of it, there's a great quote by somebody named Samuel Tyler uh, Coolridge, 
in the it's in politics what begins with fear usually ends in folly so if the only thing you have to fear is fear itself and if in politics what begins with fear ends in folly really means that it's just all bullshit right and there's another there's another great quote and this one may not come from what a lot of people consider to be a great man, but I still think it's a great quote and it's along these same lines. And it says the best things in life are on the other side of fear. And that was Will Smith. Yes. The hmm. fresh Prince. <laughs> well, he is a wise individual. And he, it's, we've taught, we taught, I actually mentioned this story on another one of our podcasts a while ago where he talks about going skydiving yeah he, he tells the story about going skydiving i won't go into the whole thing because i did it once before but him and his buddies were all freaking out about going skydiving but then when they actually got out of the plane it was the greatest experience he had in his life like maybe outside of having kids and being married and all that other stuff but he had a great time right so embrace fear yes don't run from it so let's go into what, what is fear culture, Craig? Okay. Well, fear, fear culture is, and, you know, no one sows fear like Americans, especially our media, our politicians, social media, and religious leaders. Mm -hmm. Fear culture is once they, they spread all this fear propaganda because they want their citizens to be afraid. They want the, their followers to be afraid because they're easier to control when they're afraid. So they will create things that don't actually exist to make these people afraid. Like, you know, the, the perfect example is Republicans saying the Democrats are going after your guns, which you and I have talked about extensively on other podcasts and stuff like that. Democrats aren't going after your guns. Republicans have been doing it for years. Yeah. The two biggest sweeping gun control measures written in U.S. history were both penned by Republicans. Right. The you know, and, the Act. Right. And then with the invention of social media and the spreading of false, false information and these memes, you know, everybody's too lazy to just fact check them. It's, it's real simple. You know, you see this meme and go, wow, that's scary. Wait a minute. I'm going to go to Google and I'm going to fact check this. And then you find out that meme is false because I mean, it's been proven that, you know, Russian bots have hacked into Facebook and spread misinformation to help, with the election <laughs> it, and they help form policy here and there's it it seems fantastic it seems it seems unrealistic that somebody can do this but in these in the videos that we had from uh osama or osama bin laden in there he's telling his followers how pathetic we are that they can talk about doing something and if we spend billions of dollars and they right. spent nothing they created a video in a cave throw it to the you know you know months later it goes by a mule and horseback and then finally on a boat and then to a plane and then to a mailbox to the new york times it gets distributed amongst Americans and next thing you know we're spending billions of dollars on planes and we're going to countries where they don't they're not even in and they spent what nothing exactly zero you know it, it it it's weird too cuz you know as human beings we fear that which we don't understand we have a fear of the unknown and Instead of trying to understand that, to overcome that fear, we just embrace the fear. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, like, El if Alfred Hitchcock was alive today, he would mm -hmm. have tons and tons of material to make new movies out of. <laughs> yeah, and he'd be scared of the news. Yep. Because our news media right now is more of a horror film than yeah. the horror films were in his day. Right. Well, and the big part of that is, you know, we talked about this before, and I always say that we talked about this. Everybody, I'm sure everybody's talked about this, but when you and I were kids, we had people like Walter Cronkite and Dan Rather. 
which just mm -hmm. told us the facts. They didn't tell us their opinions. They told us the facts. Right. And in the news, there would also be a feel-good section to say, hey, look, not everything's bad. But with the advent of 24-hour news channels and things like that and having to create content, the best way to do that is to sow fear. You mm -hmm. know, you know, as, you know, you know, from that video that we watched, you know, I'm just going to go straight down for like a seven-year period. From 2001, the news told us to be afraid of anthrax. 2002, they told us to be afraid of smallpox. 2003, said be afraid of SARS. 2004, be afraid of influenza. 2005, mad cow disease. 2006, the bird flu. 2006 slash 2007, E. coli. Yeah. You know, every year is something new. And then if you look back to when you and I were kids, from the 60s to the 80s, you know, the Cold War was in effect. Everybody was afraid of a nuclear war. Then the AIDS epidemic came up in the 80s and the war on drugs. You know, every time. I mean, there's people that have made careers out of fear monitoring. I mean, look at Nancy Grace. Right. Every, every program she does is to spread fear. Lou Dobbs, same network, CNN, was on the brink of being canceled. And then he changed his format from just talking about relevant news stories to spinning a relevant news story into a catastrophe and his ratings soared. And he's still on the air today because of this. Right. Right. And you know, it's today our biggest fear is immigrants, you know, but throughout the ages, every immigrant, culture that has come here we have feared we feared the irish we put the japanese in concentration camps i mean every oh every, internment camps yeah they're concentration camps i don't give a <laughs> fuck what you want to call them or anybody else wants to call them but i mean with the whole nuclear war thing and everybody's afraid of it so fallout shelters i mean you got to look at where the money goes to with when these fear things come up Exactly. Who it's it's just like in a murder murder case when you're trying to figure it out. Who stands to profit? You know, it can be something as simple as a wallet being gone. Who needed that wallet from this dead individual? You know, that's those are that's how um that's how most murders are solved. Is they think about like especially when it comes to was there life insurance involved? Okay, now let's look at the spouse. You know, let's look at the spouse's children. You know, let's look at who stands to profit. And that's generally where you're going to find the answer. Right. You know, and, you know, we, talk, we talked about this a little bit in the Halloween episode where, you know, everybody's like, check the kids' candy and stuff like that. that spread this whole fear thing when in reality, one child died from poison candy and it was because his father killed him trying to collect life insurance. Exactly. It's but in let, I want to reiterate that one child in U.S. history has ever died from Halloween candy, and his own father was the one that did it. Right. But the thing is, is that's the main content that the news. Everybody's afraid of losing a child. Mm -hmm. So that's you know okay fear okay child abduction okay you know poison candy, razor blades and apples, stuff like that. So you're afraid for your kids. So keep people afraid for their children. You know, you and I were up, growing up, we went outside without asking for permission or anything like that. Today's society, you don't want, nobody wants to let their kids outside for five minutes without watching. Right. Because they're afraid they're going to get abducted. Mm hmm And yeah, it's, okay. I want to clarify has child deductions happened? Yeah. But as you know, most child abductions are done by a non custodial parent. So, what that means is most child abductions are done by when a parent, when parents split, the one that doesn't get the kid usually steals the kid. That's what a big portion of them are. Now, right. yes, before everybody goes nuts and says, what about these child abduction rings? What about, uh, you know, yes, I've seen the videos on YouTube too of people just running up and grabbing people's kids and jumping in vans and taking off. 
I've seen the CTT uh, videos of all that stuff. 99.99999% of those are not in America. Okay. Well, and really, when it comes to human trafficking, I mean, there's been like, you know, conspiracy theories, which are backed with a lot of fact about it's really the government that's running the, you know, the human trafficking. You know, it's companies like CPS and stuff like that. <laughs> right. Um, so there was a, a case in, uh, give me a, give me a second on, on this one. Um, well, while you're doing that, I'm going to, while you're looking that up, I'm going to talk about the, the video Jason and I were referring to was called The Culture of Fear. It's on YouTube, and it's based off a book by Barry Glasner, who's a sociologist and a PhD. And, you know, something they mentioned, I'm going to go over some facts that they mentioned in the thing, because terrorism is probably the thing that Americans are most afraid of today. But in reality, one in five deaths in the U.S. are from smoking-related deaths. One in five deaths are related to heart disease. You have a 1% chance of dying while driving, and more people die by drowning in bathtubs or falling off a chair. There's a greater chance of dying in a toaster of an accident. You're more likely to be attacked by a shark and more likely to be killed by an asteroid than be involved in any terrorist attack and get killed by it. Exactly. But, okay, so before we go into that, the the thing is called the, the, um, the Franklin Credit Union uh, child prostitution ring it's look it up I won't go into the whole thing it's despicable it's disgusting but there was an actual thing that was going on it's a clandestine thing look it up Franklin credit union child abduction ring okay but let's go back to what you just said yeah all right there um, so shortly after 9-11 because of everybody was so wrapped up in the fear we had a hurricane that came through the Gulf and hit Texas. Okay. It was hurricane Rita. Now these people should have been airlifted and evacuated out of there, but a bunch of handicapped people in wheelchairs were left behind because they couldn't test their wheelchairs fast enough to see if any of these disabled individuals were terrorists and their wheelchairs were concealing bombs. <sighs> that happened in America, people. Yes. That we left these people in wheelchairs behind because we were afraid that their wheelchairs may have been concealing a bomb. Right. Um, yeah, one more time. Handicapped people in Texas in wheelchairs were left behind to die. I don't know if they died or not, because maybe, maybe their wheelchairs were concealing bombs. It's, it's, it's disgusting. It is. So think about the amount of money that we spend fighting terror. And like yeah. you said, shark attacks, asteroids, toasters. Yeah. The money involved in that; those kill more people than terrorists, more Americans on American soil than terrorists do. So I want billions of dollars put into fences around Florida and up up the East Coast because that's where most of the shark attacks happen in America. Right. And I want um, I want idiot proof toasters. Right. But more than more than that, when you're making the idiot proof toaster, make a toaster that works that I don't have to like fuck with the dial like 50 fucking times to try to get it to get the <laughs> okay so let's just work on that okay that would make me happy right well that's the bigger fear that I have is my toast either burning or coming out like bread right right yeah nobody likes raw toast because <laughs> no. that's just bread well you know there are four elements to a, su a successful fear propaganda. Ooh, I, I want to hear this. Number one, you need a threat. Mm -hmm. 
Number two, you need specific recommendations about how the audience should behave. Okay. Number three, you need audience perception that the recommendation will be effective in addressing the threat. And number four, you need audience perception that they are capable of performing the recommended behavior. Now, hmm. if, you ha if you're missing any of these four elements, your propaganda fails. But our news, and I mean, this goes back to probably learning from Hitler and Himmler and all that with their peer propaganda, you know, because they were the masters of it. But I think that we have taken what or our society and our media and our politicians have taken what they've done and escalated it to a point that is just out of control. I mean, you look at um, any election time, the, the attacks of fear propaganda that both parties use against each other. I mean, we have Fox News saying fear the liberals. We have CNN saying fear the conservatives. You know, it's all this divisive thing to keep us fighting amongst each other so they can get away with whatever the hell they're doing behind the scenes. Exactly. It's the, it's the man behind the curtain from Wizard of Oz thing. We're looking at the flashy, fiery face there, which you know, let's say it's, it's terrorism because that's a big one. That's been a big one for the last 20 years. You know, we're looking at this, this nameless faceless thing. And at the meantime, while we're all concerned with that, they're dropping essential programs that keep our way of life here. American because we're, we're so wrapped up. In, in in fighting amongst each other, like a good and a relevant one today is immigration. You look at the facts from Homeland Security and the Border Patrol, and they say that the influx of border jumpers, you know, illegal immigrants, is at the lowest point it has been in 20 years. But you listen to the news, and the people fighting pro wall are saying it's the worst ever. So it's a, you have to kind of weigh the facts. Who is going to profit from putting out this this terror? Well, obviously the wall people are, but why do the why do they want the wall in the first place? Because a bunch of contractors are going to make money off it. That's all it's about. Is a wall going to stop anybody? No, it didn't. Ha it didn't help in Berlin when they had East Germany and West Germany. They had a wall down the middle of the city, and people were going back and forth freely. Well, not yeah. really freely, but they got back and forth. We have hundreds of miles of wall already up, but that's not how they're getting in. No, nope, so if if you put a wall up, they find another pro way to get through it. Just look at how drugs come into America. Okay, every time that we stop an avenue for a smuggler or or a trafficker, we'll say. They find a solution. So you put, so we spend billions of dollars to putting up a wall, they'll tunnel under it. Okay, but then we put sensors in the ground. Okay, now they'll fly over it. Okay, then we put air, air patrol over there. Okay, then they'll, they'll put it in a submarine, they'll go around it. So it's a, they're going, it's, it's good, they're going, the drugs are going to get in because the people are here to buy them. That's right. why they're coming here. It has, no, if we didn't buy drugs, they wouldn't come here. Well, and there's a simple fix to it. Make them legal. Exactly. Like they do in what, what country is it that drug, they don't have any drug laws and they have more clinics and stuff like that. And they, because of that, they have less, you know, overdoses and things like that and in, less in, crime around it. In, in the Netherlands. It's that way. Yeah. In certain areas, you all drugs are not all drugs are legal to do within that you know designated area. But yeah, they they have um, uh, places where they get they can get free needles so that they're not transmitting diseases back and forth. Um, there's less crime because the drugs are regulated. It, it Australia has done this too in certain areas where they've done it with brothels. They've made prostitution legal. And it's actually decreased crime because now the women are getting tested. Their people are going to the same spot. They're not meeting in back alleys. The women are never alone. 
you know, without knowing, you know, they may be alone in the room, but there's somebody outside the door. So there's less violent crime towards the women. They're not ending up dead in ditches because people are coming to them in the room. They're checking in. And it's decreased crime. It's decreased crime there. So there's, yes, there are simple solutions. Yeah, but, but our politicians don't want those simple solutions because there's no profit in them. Exactly. It, just like in, uh, there was an episode of Family Guy where Brian breaks into a safe that uh, uh, Lo- Lois's father has, and in it he has the cure for cancer. He's like, you animal, you have the cure for cancer? He's like, yeah. There's no money in curing a disease. There's only money in treating it. And unfortunately, that's how our, that's how big business works. We're right. just well. And here's another quote from that video um, from a doctor, and I can't remember his name, but he went on to say that we're afraid of illness, we're afraid of the drugs to treat the illness, and we're afraid of the vaccines that will stop the illness from happening. Right. And why? And a lot of that has to go with, again, follow the money trail. Big Pharma, follow the money trail. See who their lobbyists are paying off in the government. I mean, um, it both sides too. I mean, I think Cory Booker got like 200 grand in one year just from Big Pharma. Mm. You know, and he's a, you know, leading Democrat in from New Jersey. You know, so it's it's both sides. It's not just the Republicans. It is both sides. Yeah, I can't remember the doctor's name, but his book is called False Alarm. That's right. Uh, but um, but yeah, it, exactly. So every step of of an illness, we're afraid. It's like we're afraid of being sick. We're afraid of going to the doctor because. We don't know what our healthcare is going to cover and how much it's going to cost us to go to the doctor. Then we're afraid of the pills that they give us because we really don't know what the side effects are. Can it, is, is this going to be like another fin fin? Is this going to be another, God knows how all these other Paxil and all these other pills that I don't think Paxil is one of them, but there's a whole bunch of pills out there that, you know, will rush through clinical trials. And then next thing you know, it's like, ah, oh, you know, the side effect, it just shuts your liver down. That's a, it's no big deal. Right. Yeah. You don't need it. we're we're afraid of that and then on top of that there are simple vaccinations that you get but you're afraid of what's in those because you're you don't they're coming out there's different things like mercury red mercury and other things that are in in some of these things like you don't understand why they're in there right that and there's the fear that the vaccines are going to cause autism and things like that. And I haven't fact checked to that, but I don't really find that plausible. Well, there's, I'm glad you brought up autism because there's a really good, uh, see, I love a good conspiracy theory because I love conspiracy theories because of the way that they inspire talk. They, they inspire a dialogue. And there's a great one that's going around now that, Big Pharma, along with our, our our entertainment, is pushing that being autistic is cool. And you see that in movies like The Accountant, where Ben Affleck is autistic. The mm. Good Doctor is Good Doctor? Yeah, where the kid is yeah. autistic. He's like an autistic Doogie Hauser. Then you have um, uh, all the Asperger people from, from Big Bang Theory. Then, you know, there's there's all these different characters that are coming out on or uh, atypical was another one on Netflix where they're pushing out there that it's okay to be autistic. It's actually kind of cool to be autistic. You're like almost superhuman. So like in the back of our mind, it's like, Oh yeah, autism is not that bad, which in some cases, autism isn't bad. Right. They're just essentially, there's nothing more than being socially awkward. Right. There's some bad autistic cases, of course. Well, let's look at it from the aspect of the autistic person. Mm-hmm. They don't know any other life than what they have. Right. So it kind of goes back to, you know, as a kid, you want to lose your virginity, but you've never experienced it, so you don't know what you're you're getting, you know? Yeah. It's, 
they don't know how it is to be quote unquote normal. So, and a lot of these people are happy. Mm -hmm. So why should we fuck with their happiness? <laughs> exactly. I mean, I worked in group homes for years with the developmentally disabled. A lot of them were happy with their routines and their life and stuff like that and didn't like it to be fucked with. Yeah. I worked with, I worked with, <laughs> I worked there for a very, very short time. And in there, I didn't understand that a bun coffee maker has a switch on the side that keeps the water hot at all times so that when you pour the water in the top, the coffee starts brewing instantly. I accidentally bumped it and turned that switch off. And oh man, did that set all of them off in the morning? The ones that got to drink coffee. Oh if yeah. Coffee wasn't ready instantly. Oh, I felt so bad because I I did I honestly didn't know it was a simple, it was an honest mistake. Right. I, at that moment, I had to realize it's not my world. This is right. their world. This is what they do. You know, they have to. I mean, they have every right to have their coffee when they wake up because I like my coffee when I wake up. Right. Right. So, you know, and they are similar to that, to us. They fear what they have no control over. You know, mm -hmm. so if, like you said, they don't have their coffee, they had no control over that. Mm -hmm. So now that's causing anxiety, that's causing stress. Mm -hmm. And really interesting fact that fear and excitement have the exact same response in your physical body. Mm but it's your brain that's triggered differently, mm. you know? And it's, you can actually control that. I mean, you can't control how your body acts, but you can control your thoughts. Mm -hmm. And that's something when we get into how, I'll get into this more when we talk about how to fight off the fear propaganda and the fear culture and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's, it's really interesting that, you know, the biology of fear itself is pretty, pretty amazing. <laughs> And going back to autism real quick, like, like, in why they're socially awkward is like, I heard you know, this was on another podcast. Um, one of the two gentlemen that host it, he's got an autistic son, and he talks about his son on there a lot. But one of the things that he was saying there was, when a child is born, and they start growing up a little bit, almost instantly, they can recognize emotion in your face and understand what they are. They see your face when you're happy, they get happy. When you're sad, they start getting sad. They, they, they relate and they understand what emotions are. In a lot of autistic kids, they don't know that instinctively. It's like when you're happy, they have to like, uh, um, they have to process, okay, that look means that they're happy. Okay, so then I can be happy too. Or right. what was that look again? I've seen that one before. What is that? So they have to consciously figure out what your expression is. And that's why that they're socially awkward a lot because they're, they don't have that instinctive relationship with emotion. Like, like most of us are born with. Right. And they don't understand their emotions either. A right. majority, you know. So when they have fear or they have excitement, they don't, they can't tell the difference. And so it causes stress. It causes anxiety. It causes behavior problems. So, but, you know, there's a lot of ways I respect that because there's a lot, it, I'm just as guilty as any other American out there when it comes to some of this stuff. I get worked up when, yeah. I, when I read a headline. It's like, you know, Sometimes I get, I get worked up for a lot of reasons. One, I get worked up about the fear itself that's involved in it. And it's like, oh man, oh wait, uh, you, to go through the cycle, it's like, oh my God, now, can, can Legos really kill a child? <laughs> what yeah, the, they get fuck, what the fuck are they doing over there at Lego? Why are they <laughs> killing children? And then I realize it's like, oh, they're talking about if a kid is dumbass and he swallows the little thing. Well, of course, you, there's an age limit on the thing. So then you have to go through this whole thing, and then, then I get mad. It's like, well, why are they putting out a news story like that? That is misleading. Then I, you know, so this is why I don't really watch the news at all, because 
I go through this roller coaster of rage, you know, starting off with, why would they do that? And then it gets into, why would they do that? But now I just shifted the blame from the story to this, to this, to the person that's telling the story. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's, you, you have shows that have done nothing but perpetuate the fear culture. I mean, to catch a predator, America's won't most wanted. It takes a thief. All these shows were set up to keep people afraid. Mm-hmm. You know, like, you know, the Discovery Channel came out with It Takes a Thief, where these two guys who were former thieves go in to people's houses, break into their houses against whatever security system they had and stuff like that and show ways around it. Mm-hmm. Now, there is no other reason for that except for to maybe sell better security systems and to keep people afraid. Yes. You know, look at all these commercials where, you know, these security company commercials where people are breaking in and break security will save your life and da da da. <laughs> right. There was one of those that I think had an adverse effect. It was a 2020 um thing and they were it was a it was a it was a fear thing because it was an epidemic of cars being stolen in South Florida. And when they were when they were doing this they brought in their their car thief expert. Okay. And they had it they had this car with the latest alarm. It was it had the club, which was a huge, huge waste of time back in the day. It had everything was state of the art. And the thief was in and had the car started and was ready to go in less than 40 seconds. Hmm. Now, going into this, I'm like, how the fuck is he going to get around the club? How is he going to do that? The club is impenetrable. Right. That you had to have to keep your car safe. And, you know, it's like you can't turn the wheel with it. So this expert, now, I'm going to, I'm just going to go ahead and say the expert happened to be a 14-year-old kid. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. And he had this car. St- he's not even legal to drive, but he broke into this car, had it ready to go in less than, four, less than 40 seconds. Wow. But it was like, how is he going to get past the club? Because that was, you know, the club was the impenetrable fortress. He just took a pair of bolt cutters, cut the steering wheel, and pulled it off. Huh. And threw it in the back seat and was ready to go. So he disabled the alarm, cut the steering wheel, pulled it out, hot wired it and was ready to go 40 seconds I've, right. tried, I've tried to cut locks on fences and stuff with bolt cutters and it took me longer than 40 seconds just to do that. <laughs> right. I'm really impressed with with the uh, the skill level of the child but with that it actually would open my eyes and like that thing is just all fear propaganda mm-hmm. the club did absolutely nothing to protect you from somebody who's actually going to steal your car. So right. the best bet in the case like that, if you're so worried about somebody stealing your car, get good insurance. Yeah. Yeah, really. You know, it's the best defense against fear propaganda is refusing to be afraid of it. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Like and, we, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, look, we were, we were talking about with uh, um, the last, the last 20 years, terror has been the big bugaboo in everybody's fear fear bug we yes we had the 9-11 thing we had uh, Oklahoma City bombing we had uh, you know several others but when you think about it outside of 9-11 and we won't go to the conspiracy theories of 9-11 we'll just say 9-11 was an attack caused by somebody right uh, we, we won't even talk about that one. But outside of that, 90% of the terror attacks that have happened here have happened by Americans or nationalized citizens. Right. Meaning that they are still American citizens. They became American citizens after they got here. So right. So when we're talking about, we had a bombing of the, you, or the World Trade Center, then we had the planes hit the Trade Center. So if you take those two out, and we'll say that that may we'll say that they were, you know, Al Qaeda. We'll say that both of them were done by them. So, but you take those two events out, all the rest of them, just about all the I'll say just about all the rest of them because I don't know for hundred percent, but just about all the rest of them were done by Americans. 
Right. Oklahoma City was the most deadliest attack on U.S. soil outside of a military thing that happened at Pearl Harbor and what happened in New York City. And that was by an American trained soldier. So just put that in your bag when you start thinking about blaming people from other countries coming over here to harm us. Right. Us. We don't need them to. We'll do it to ourselves. Exactly. So think about these, these things. Why, why do we say that a six foot six Saudi Arabian with a kidney failure who needed dialysis, who was jumping cave to cave, was the mastermind of all of the terror in the world? Why would we say that? And you, like, I'm going to, going to go into it because we have to follow the money. Why do we follow the money? Because we needed a way to get into the Middle East. Right. Militarily. But why? Why did we have to go to the Middle East? And there's, in, when we did go over there, why did we go, end up going after Saddam Hussein when we're supposed to be over there after bin Laden? Why did we go? We found Hussein in a hole under a blanket in the backyard of somebody, some random person. Why did we find him in this little spider hole? Well, we couldn't find Bin Laden, a six foot six guy with dialysis in a mountain cave. Why couldn't we find him? Because we weren't looking for him. He was not the target. We needed to get into, into the Middle East. And it's particularly, we needed to get into Iraq because Saddam Hussein was going to try to push OPEC to move us, or sorry, move how oil is sold from being dollars to euros. Now, why is that important? Because that is the last thing in the world that is based in a US, US standard. If we were, if they were to change oil to go from US dollars to Euro, there would be nothing tangible in the entire world that is bought and sold solely on the US dollar and it could have crumbled our economy. Makes sense. <laughs> That's why we went after Saddam Hussein. Right. We were never going after bin Laden. Why yep. do you think what we, when we finally found him, now they said they, they double tapped him, threw him on a boat, tossed him into the ocean, like ceremoniously uh, under Muslim law. Even if we did, who cares? He was never the target. It was he was he was the 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 specter, you know, the the syndicate behind everything. You're you're telling me that he's doing all this from a cave, sending videotapes that we're getting six months after they were made, is masterminding these intricate plots and plans to come over here. Whether it happened or not, it was never the target. It was never the plan. The plan was to get over there to save our economy. Right. And put a bunch of money in people's pockets while they did it. Right. And, you know, pretty much Bush Sr. and Dick Cheney were the masterminds behind all that. Oh, yeah. And if you don't know anything about the Bush family, I mean, you may, you may see Jr. walking around, you know, that whole thing at his dad's funeral while he's sharing candies with uh, Michelle Obama, you know, this lovable tramp that he is now. It's like, Oh, look at him. Yeah. He's, he used to be president. Go back and look at their grandfather, Prescott, or Prescott Bush. They made their fortune by stealing money and, and laundering Nazi money that they stole from the Jews. Wow. Well, Behind every, the, there's, a, there's a great quote that says, behind every fortune stands a man with a gun. Right. Well, and you look at, you know, we talk about, we talked at the beginning how this has gone back centuries. Every government started by somebody getting overthrown. Mm -hmm. You know, our government started by overthrowing England. Yes. You know, the English rule. Now we came up with our own. And, you know, the average government only lasts 300 years before it either changes to something else or is overthrown or something else happens to it. And we're reaching that 300-year point. <laughs> it, we're, we're getting a lot closer. Where you have, like, 
you know, on the left, people are going for more socialistic forms, and on the right, people are going for more fascist forms, and they're get they're both getting their followers to vote against themselves. It, exactly. Um, it, it's it's an old trait here that we've done here in America, where we're the only actual country, civilized country in the world, that will declare war on itself. We declare war on the drug. We have a war on drugs. We have a war on poverty. We have a war on, uh, you know, uh, um, a war on crime. You know, whatever. We always declare war on social issues. Yeah, because that's how we get people afraid. Um, what was it? Himmler said that um, you can get people who would normally not vote for a war and be against a war to support a war by, by sowing fear. Yeah. Yeah. And we're, we're seeing that now where, uh, everybody talks about socialism, like it's Nazism, like it's, like it, it's, you know, this, uh, cold war era, um, Soviet union. That's look at Canada is socialist. They're doing fine. Right. Sweet. Yeah. yeah. Denmark. Yep. Australia. And the, and the thing is, it's, no, it's not, socialist. You know, it's not just, you know, socialism, but it's more democratic socialism. So it's like everything the, to make the best of something, you take pieces from everything else that works and put them together. Exactly. You make an amalgamation of things. And, and one and of the that, one of the things ahead. I hear about Canada. Say, well, we don't want to be like Canada, you know, say, well, they're free health care. you got to wait in line. Have you been to the emergency room lately? Yeah, no shit. Or try to get a doctor's appointment. If you're right. sick and you need to see a doctor, you have to go to a ready care because if you call your family doctor, they'll give you an appointment, but it's going to be three months from now. Right. And the symptoms will be gone by then. Yeah. Or you'll be dead. Right. So it's going to ready care or an ER and then you're sitting there for several hours. Yeah. Waiting fucking line. Exactly. So what's the difference? One way we don't have to pay for it. Right. <laughs> so uh, yeah. it, you have to think about things and that's, I know that's hard for a lot of people to do is to think for yourself and don't just go by what you hear on the news. I think one of the, one of the, uh, one of my things that I love doing is I love going to, I have apps for different news stations from around the world. And I love reading their stories about us because they're, yes, their media has bias towards their issues. But one of the things that they have, is they hold no punches on calling us stupid. BBC loves the BBC loves calling us stupid, especially when it comes to things like you're afraid of socialism, that type of stuff. And right. but not only have we gotten so far as to you know be afraid of things that have no merit being afraid of, we're also starting to dictate who's an enemy right and now it's the the party lines have been drawn and now it's almost like a hetfield mccoy type of thing it's the north versus the south it's almost a civil war if you're liberal or conservative and the, even within those things you're too conservative you're too liberal right you know and that and so there's infighting within the infighting it's 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 ridiculous what we need to do is just look at what will actually help america and if you want right. to clear the swamp clear the fucking swamp start fresh get yep. some get some get some younger people in there who are going to be around to see the results of your actions right now a lot of, that's going to fear a lot of people right there there's a lot of and get people who you know grew up in poverty mm -hmm. get people who you know 
you know, worked hard for a living, not people that were handed everything. You know, because all of our politicians, they're all from wealthy families. I mean, there's, I'm sure there's a few that, you know, mm -hmm. built themselves up. But the majority of them are from wealthy families that have had everything. And, you know, everybody talks about, you know, how our kids are so entitled. It's not our kids that are entitled. It's our, the older generation that, are, that have that sense of entitlement. Right. Like, I'm old. I can act however the fuck I want to act. You know, and people just have to deal with it because I'm old. Yeah. No, that's no excuse. You're, if you're a piece of shit, you're a piece of shit. Right. In <laughs> the, the old people today were the hippies of old. And they were the ones, their generation are the ones that in tried to inspire change. They tried to do everything, but now they're scared of change. Yeah. And they're pretty much the reason why we have the climate change and global warming and all that. They, yeah. They work to destroy our planet. So is that fear out of guilt? That's a, that's a great observation because because maybe now that they're coming towards, you know, they, that the golden years of their life, they're realizing that all that idealistic notions that they had as a youth, they fucked up. Right. They, they sold out. They turned their back on. They sold out. Exactly. You know what? So I'll say this. I'll be the, I won't be the first one, but I'll say it loud and I'll say it proud. Fuck the hippie generation because you motherfuckers turned your back on us. Yep. You know, yep. and I can't say anything, but you know, I'm, we're Gen Xers. And what did we do to fix it? Nothing. Nothing. We're just as guilty. What did Gen Y do? Nothing. What is, you know, the millennials, some of them are actually, you know, they get a, they get a bad rap because they're, they're entitled. And yeah, a lot of them are, a lot of them are vapid, but guess what? A lot of our generation was too. And the previous generations, it's it, no it, different. <laughs> exactly. But one thing I will say about them is they grew up in an era where you can get out a message just for, you can get out a message and you can get out something instantly. And they know how to do that better than anybody else in history. They know how to, you know, to speak to the masses faster than they can, they can get information to travel from one person to the other side of the world like that. Yeah. They, basically they understand how to get something viral in an instant. It, exactly. They, they understand all this stuff. So if, we can educate them properly and use this ability that n at no other time in history have we had, they can actually inspire global right. change. Because I mean, if you really look at the facts, the world today is no more dangerous than it was hundreds of years ago where, you know, a brother would kill his brother to get the throne or, you know, just stupid shit like that. The only difference is now, we have media where you can hear about it within five seconds. Exactly. We're not bricking people up in towers and letting them starve to death inside there. Letting them turn savage and kill each other. You know, we're not taking whole villages and enslaving them and then selling them to another village. We're, you know, there was some horrific things that happened back, back then. And statistically in America, we are safer now than we ever have been in our entire history. Yep. And if you don't believe me, go to the, go to the Homeland security and go to the FBI and look at their criminal statistics. Yep. And, and also go to center of disease control and see what you're more likely to die from. <laughs> exactly. Those fucking sharks, man. Yep. Fucking sharks. I mean, People are afraid of the color of somebody's skin, but they're not afraid to go buy a fucking Big Mac. Yeah. Which is more likely to kill you than that person with a different color skin. Exactly. And here in the state of Washington, there's actually a, a commercial that's, that's rolling around that opiate overdose 
kills more people than auto accidents in our state now. I think it's the same here too. And it's, those are the things that we need to really look at. Instead right. of changing how you get the pills or what's, what's actually in the pills or why the pills exist in the first place or, you know, the amount of heroin that's, or opiates that are, are just getting out there, we're looking at changing how our cars drive. Right. Well, you know what? We, we've almost talked about this for an hour, so why don't we transition into how we can overcome this? Okay. The first thing I would like to see happen, okay, and I know you have – you, you, I want to, I want to throw this out there and I know you've got a lot of stuff on this part because positivity is, is a, is a Craig nature, but I want to see our media start referring to, uh, threats of terrorism, uh, notions of terrorism and all that with the same pedantic attitude that they do with UFO and alien sightings. Yeah, when I would love to see, and what I mean by that is, I'd love to see, uh, to use a Don Henley term, the bubble-headed bleach blonde on the, on the six o'clock news, saying, huh, "Must have been terrorist." <laughs> <laughs> that would be awesome, but in you know, and we've talked about energy, like positive energy attracts positive, negative energy attracts negative. If you're focused on a terrorist attack, you're attracting that terrorist attack. <laughs> you know what? Just don't go where the terrorists are. Right. Don't go to the back, you know, the back desert of Syria where they're blowing right. shit up. There you yeah. go. And you know, there's the Ariana Grande concert. Don't go there. Right. And I mean, everybody talks about, oh, you know, I don't, you know our culture is really bad at victim shaming. Yes. You know, um, well, you shouldn't award that to the bar. It, right. You know, instead, of, instead of you shouldn't award that to the bar, perhaps you should have gone to the bar with better friends. Yeah. People look, they'll look out for you. Yeah. If, if you're going to do something stupid, because we've all done stupid shit in our life. So perhaps uh, maybe you could be a better person and not go after the drunk chick. Right. Yeah. You know, instead of shaming the victim, we should be going after the attackers. I said, I said drunk chick because it does happen the other way too. So, yes. uh, but I found some great resources online and how to combat our fear culture. All right. I can't wait. And there is this lady, Mel Robbins. She has a book out. I don't remember the name of the book, but you can find her all over YouTube and she has something that she's given away on YouTube. So I don't mind sharing it here, you know, but she has something she calls the five second rule with an anchor thought. Hmm. She just has, and, uh, she has a couple of books here. You're playing with fire, kick ass, the five second rule and uh, the, the four arguments. Right. And I listened to her talk and she had like a Ted talk. She had, I found her on YouTube. She's got a bunch, you know, from where she's been interviewed. And basically, you know, you need to face your fears head on, which we all know this, it's common sense. But it's from her that I found out that fear and excitement were the exact same thing in your body. Hmm. Now, the five second rule is basically like, let's, for example, um, you're gonna, you're getting ready to go on a trip and you're gonna fly and you're afraid to fly. You have a fear of flying. So instead of focusing on that fear of flying, say you're say for you you're coming home to to see your family you're coming back to michigan and what is it that you like and what 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 makes you excited about coming to michigan just to see everybody yep so so instead of focusing on that fear of flying what you would do is when that fear hits that and your body's tingling and you can change that fear into excitement by going by counting back on five, four, three, two, one, and then putting the anchor thought in there of seeing your family and seeing your friends and, you know, that being excited about visiting everybody. And you can change that fear into excitement. 
Now the anchor thought is important because it's something that anchors you, obviously, so you don't escalate a situation into a full-blown panic attack or in a situation where you screw things up. Mm. And it's we talked about we've talked in the past about reprogramming your brain, and this is a great tool to use for that. But, you know, we, like I said earlier, we can't control how our body acts, but we can control how, what our thoughts and what we're thinking about. Right. No, I, I really like that because there's, there's a lot of other uh, principles that are similar to that, but I really like, like that. It's like going back to like simple goal setting where you have something, uh, Charlene Johnson, who has like the plyo uh, Mm -hmm. workout thing. She also does a whole bunch of stuff on goals and she has this. Uh, notion called uh, set goals where it's kind of similar to that where once you once you start setting up she has a thing where you have 10 different goals you have like a religious goal a financial goal a a success goal health goal and all these different or I guess she doesn't call it religious she called spiritual but uh, you go through all these different things and then when you start looking at you look at them at a whole you start understanding that one goal can take care of like four of these Mm -hmm. and that's what she refers to as a set goal so if you set this goal you can achieve four of these other ones so if you have that focus would you call it a anchor yeah if you have that anchor to anchor that you probably can overcome four or five different fears oh yeah definitely well uh, not because like in travel you don't have just one fear of, of just flying. A lot of times it's the fear of the person that's sitting next to you. It's, yeah. you know, a fear of like, oh, I'm going to be stuck in this thing, claustrophobia. You know, if you had that anchor goal, you probably could take care of most of those. Right. Well, and here's like the science behind the five second rule. Um, once you do that five second rule, it asserts control and awakens your prefrontal cortex. Mm. And that's how you're able to, you know, switch that fear to excitement. Now, say so like you said, we are afraid of the person sitting next to you. So instead of fearing that person sitting next to you, when that hits, you go five, four, three, two, one. I bet you this is a really interesting person. I'm excited to know more about them. And then you strike up a conversation and you make a lifelong friend. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> quick, quick story. I was on a flight. Like, well, this is the last time I came back from Michigan. I'm on a I'm on a flight, and it's I won't say the airline, but they have got the little screens in the back of the seat, so it's got like the, all this on demand stuff. And we did not have a good time getting on this plane. And my my wife and I were separated. She had to sit in another seat. We because we were the last. We ordered our tickets months in advance, but we were the last two to get seat assignments. Oh, she didn't even know we were going to get on the plane. So I'm all I'm all pissed off about this. So I sit down there and I, I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna pick the most offensive movie that's on here. And I I turn it on, it's Deadpool 2. I'm like, all right, people are gonna die. He's gonna swear a lot, he's gonna make rude gestures. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, I'm in the halfway through it, and I realized that there was uh, an elderly gentleman sitting next to me, and then there was a younger, younger guy sitting on the other side of me. Uh the I kept seeing this older gentleman laughing <laughs> like I kept looking at him it's like you know by this time you know I'm an hour into the movie I, I'm like calm down and he didn't have headphones I'm like hey you know I have an extra set of headphones if you want to watch he goes no I've already seen that it's a great movie <laughs> so like I picked an offensive movie and then I'm having to look up and like eight other people are watching the same movie I had no effect on anybody on that plane by my my movie choice because Tons of other people were watching the same movie. I was in the middle of the plane, so it was a bunch of them that were behind me that probably had the same had the same movie going. The guy right. who wasn't offended because he went to the theater and saw it. And then the other guy next to me, I, I ended up talking with him too, and ended up being, you know, there were two great human beings with great stories. Right. Sorry, I'm getting ready to throw something at my dog. <laughs> she wants to bark, and then she's staring at me. I'll hurt you. <laughs> For those that are watching the video of this, I thought Craig was stepping up to me. <laughs> Sorry. Shut up, dog. The UPS guy is gone. I know you heard his van, but he's gone. 
Mm. You can't bark at him anymore. Okay. So there is another guy on there. I didn't get to watch all this video, but it was like a two hour long video. But I think the title of it was how to overcome alternative, alternative um, media um, and overcome the fear of it. Mm. And, Yes, for those that just saw that, I missed the dog. It was just a scare. <laughs> um, but it's like a two-hour thing. I didn't get to watch the whole thing, but his name is, well, Lisa's YouTube channel is Lennon, L-E-N-O-N, Honor, H-O-N-O-R. It's two words. And he's basically, you know, just saying, you know, from what I saw, the 20 minutes of the two-hour video that I saw was basically just saying, you control your fear. You're choosing to be fear. You know, they have no control over you. You're allowing them to have that control, mm -hmm. which we, we've talked about time and time again on so many different podcasts. You know, it's, if you're afraid, it's your fault. It, exactly. Here is a perfect example. You and I lived in Pittsburgh. We went to the Art Institute of Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. One time I had a job interview that was downtown. And downtown, mind you, was probably, I don't know, maybe two, three miles from where we lived. About that, yeah. So I, could, I, didn't, I couldn't catch a bus on the way back, so I had to walk back. And I had a job interview, so I was dressed up. Well, on the route back, I walked straight through the ghetto. Mm -hmm. I was more afraid of getting hit by a car when I'm crossing the on-ramps and off-ramps for the highway than I was anybody in the ghetto. <laughs> right. Nobody said anything to me. Nobody said boo. Nobody approached me. Nobody tried to mug me. None of that shit. Right. <laughs> and, and along those same lines, I worked in downtown at a gas station there, and we were a full service station, and, and me, uh, I think they called it mini serve. But w we pumped all the gas for everybody, and we did all the cash exchanges for for everything right there at the pump. So there were times when I had two or three thousand dollars in my pockets. Oh wow! <laughs> there was there, there was no other place to put it. We didn't have an office that you could just walk in and put the money money down. You had to like take some of it and roll it up and put it in this pocket and put it in this pocket. But at no time was I ever really scared. Right. I mean, yeah. Granted, we had beat cops. When we were open 24 hours, so the cops that walked downtown would always come to ours because we had a we had a coffee machine, and we'd always just set quarters on the on on the table, and they would come in and they just help themselves to coffee. You know that was kind of our tribute to them, I guess. But at, right. they weren't there all the time, and no, at no time did I ever feel, you know, scared because I pumped gas. Right. And you know, and I've had bunch of jobs like that and I stuff like that where I'm in the bad part like I delivered pizzas in Muskegon to Muskegon Heights which is the high crime area of Muskegon mm -hmm. I never got mugged I was never afraid mm -hmm. main thing I got ripped off on tips <laughs> but that's about it right I when I was like I was 19 or 20 I wasn't old enough to drink yet but I a friend of mine and I we drove from Kalamazoo, I picked him up at Kalamazoo, Michigan, and we drove all the way to Minneapolis and went to a Vikings Saints football game. And after the game, for some reason, they didn't card either one of us. And he was younger than I was. They So we got just hammered drunk at this game. And somehow when we left, we got into my car and was trying to find a place to crash and just sleep in the car and then go to the Mall of America the next day and then drive home. So we ended up on the other side of the, uh, we went across the river into St. Paul. We didn't know this, you know, I was hammered drunk, so I shouldn't have been driving, but I did. And we pull over to the side of the road and we, you know, okay, this looks like a good place to crash. So we lay down. Next thing you know, there's a car that pulls up behind us with their lights on. All right, well, can't sleep with the lights on. So <laughs> we drive away, find another spot, go to sleep. Wake up a couple hours later. And we pull into this Burger King that was just right around the corner. So I, back then you still had what's called an atlas. It was a big map, a book with pages and pages of there. So I pull it out. There's the Minneapolis section. I'm like, okay, man, I'm talking to the, the kid behind the counter. It's like, where are we on this <laughs> map? 
and I need to get back to the mall. And he's like, where did you come from? And like, we slept in our car right around the corner. And he's like, I wouldn't sleep in my car around the corner. <laughs> he me that we're both, me and my friend, we're both Caucasian. And we were the only Caucasians in this Burger King. Like, oh, huh, different. So how do I get back to the mall? <laughs> <laughs> right. And see, and that is a great example of energy and fear. You weren't afraid, so nothing happened to you. Mm -hmm. You know, you didn't embrace the fear and say, oh, I'm so scared. I mean, we have, what, besides the media, we have horror movies and stuff like that. But the great thing about horror movies is you watch it, you're scared while it's going, and then it's over with, and you let the fear go because the movie's over. Yeah. But with the news, it never ends. Exactly. And you have to remember, too, with the news stories, they cherry pick what they talk about. So if they're talking about this murder, this double murder, this subduction, this, they're pulling isolated incidents out and make them sound like they're the norm. Right. And what they don't do is like, you know, when we have all these shootings and shit, the one thing they didn't, that you saw, like there was an instance down in, I want to say Texas, where this guy had, you know, chased his girlfriend into the store, convenience store or something. He had a gun. She got out of the store, went into the theater next door. He follows her into the theater. An off-duty female cop ends up shooting and killing him, and nobody else was hurt. Mm. The media didn't cover that. Why? Because it was a successful stop to a crime. Right. So that there's nothing to be afraid of. That should have been the feel-good story at the end of the night. Right. So to combat that, going back to combating this. Oh, yeah, that's fact, what we're doing. Yeah, fact check everything you see. Go, you know, don't take the media's word for it. I mean, Fox News can't even call themselves a news channel. They're opinion programming. Yeah. Which means they can spin any lie they want to mm -hmm. and get away with it. They're not regulated because they're opinion programming. Exactly. So fact check everything. It's easy to do with a fucking phone anymore. Just get on your phone, Google it, and, and read from a couple different sources. You know, if you got, you know, if there's 10 sources out there, nine of them says one thing, one says the other, good chance the nine of them are right and the one is off. And, and the, one, the, other, the one is Fox News. <laughs> and The Onion is not a good source. No. It's a humorous source, though. It's a great source. It's a great source, but that's not, that, that's not really the news. But right. the, the problem is that is closer to reality than you, than you actually know. Because right. they're, it's satirical, but they're, a lot of times all they're doing is just spinning. You know, they're, they're just spinning uh, stories out there to make them a little bit more lighthearted. Right. And, you know, so, yes, yeah, fact check thing, do the use of five second rule, and just stop yourself and think, why is this triggering the fear um, reaction in me? Mm -hmm. What is it about this that's making me scared? Right. I live in the middle of Michigan. Nothing's going to happen here. It, that, see, that's, that's a great point, because... A lot of this stuff, it's like, okay, so sarin gas was released on the Kurds back in the mid or early 90s. Damn, I better watch out for sarin gas. Right. Nobody's doing that in La Crosse, Wisconsin. Nobody gives right. a fuck. What are you, why, why are you building a shelter? Right. You know, just live your life. Yeah. Well, you know, and it's sad because, and I, I hate having to bring my father into this, but he lives in a state of fear where he's got a concealed carry permit where he can't leave the house without a gun. Mm. Not, and the excuse that he used to me was for something that happened 35 years ago mm. with a, when a guy had killed somebody. That's going to happen. But you're more likely to get hurt by somebody you know than somebody you don't know. 
Right. And the ones that no, know, know you have a gun and they know where you keep it. Right. So like in the we we watched the same YouTube video. You you forward me this YouTube video. It was a culture of fear uh, by Ken Lundra is who published it. Came out in uh, 2014, but in there there's a great little thing in there where uh, one of the one of the people's talking and they said the majority of gun related violence that happens at home happens between spouses or between mm -hmm. partners. So the best way to combat that is don't have a gun in the house. Right. <laughs> if you don't want to get shot in your own home, don't have a gun in your home because you're more likely to be shot by your partner than you are by an intruder. Right. Well, and that's like, what is it? One in four domestic abuse cases ends by one partner shooting the other one. Yes. You know, so yeah, you know, everybody needs a gun so they can stay safe. But when it's your partner, that's killing you. Yeah. Yeah. With the yeah. gun that you bought. Right. So how's that for karma? <laughs> <laughs> right. So really what we're, what we're trying to say, you know, I'm not going to try to wrap this all up, but in a nutshell is, you know what? Quit watching the news. Just if you need, a, a, actually, I want to do one thing before we wrap that up. There is read the book Four Hour Work Week by Tim Ferriss. Okay. In the book, he has a total media blackout, is one of the things you need to do to be happy. And what that means is don't read the newspaper, don't don't uh, go to websites, don't, you know, just don't watch the news, just don't. Right. Don't. Yeah, <laughs> because they got social media, all it, that. Exactly. There's countless different uh, um, reports and uh, studies that have actually shown that people get more depressed the longer they are on Facebook. Because mm -hmm. remember, in kind of like in the media being in fear, people generally only report how happy their lives are on social media. We just went on vacation. We just bought a new car. We just got this new home. Look at our new furniture. And yep. that makes you start thinking about your life and how miserable you apparently are in your life. But you know what? If you're miserable in, like, in your life, quit fantasizing about the lives of others. Do right. something about your own life. Yeah, fuck the Joneses. There's nobody you need to keep up with but yourself. Exactly. You know what? The Joneses are up to their eyeballs in fucking debt, and they look like they have a lot of money, but inside their home, they're eating fucking Top Ramen because that's all they can afford because the right. interest payments are killing them and all the shit that they owe money on. Right. You know, and I had something. I had it. It ran away. But, yeah, I mean, yeah, I – we were, we were kind of doing like a summary. You were last talking about your dad and the, the gun violence. Yeah. I mean, yeah, no, it's not triggering it. I don't, okay. it must not be important to the topic. So, you know, let's just focus on, you know, like you said, stop watching the news, say, get off social media. You know, if you like, if I get on social media, it's for my art business and stuff like that it's to share a post or something like that. That's positive. Um, I don't, for most part, I don't comment on anything that's of a negative nature. If I start reading something of a negative nature, I catch myself and just scroll past it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's just looking, if you're looking for something positive, you're going to find something positive. Right. You know, like my Instagram is all full of art. Mm -hmm. So I don't see anything bad on it. So if I want social media, I can go to Instagram. <laughs> hey, my my Twitter feed is nothing but positive stuff and things that um you know I'm selling. <laughs> right. Well, and I think oh shit, I had it again. It came back for a second. It's a fleeting thought. <laughs> but you know, it's there's there's ways when around. Does, when he does remember it, we'll put it in the show notes. <laughs> right. But there's ways around everything. If if you're living in a state of constant fear. Reprogram your brain. Right. It's, it's not hard to do. It's we as a society, we get in comfort zones. And sometimes those comfort zones are fear, 
their anger, their animosity. And we don't like going outside our comfort zones, but you have to push yourself past that because that's when you achieve the success that you want out of life. Mm -hmm. And if you have problems with, you know, feeling like you can't get past any of this stuff, there's some great apps out there and websites out there. One, and we're not, we're not endorsed. We're not, you know, they, these aren't paid endorsements. There's Hashtag one, not an ad. Yeah. <laughs> There's Headspace, which is a, which is an app and a website, which it helps you with meditation and and stuff like that. And another one is just it's Get Help, and there's a couple others like Get Help, where they're actual uh, counselors and psychologists and psychiatrists that you can actually talk to for a monthly fee. And if you don't like one, then you can switch you can switch counselors. And so it there's resources out there if you feel that you cannot get past this thing without help then we ask that you, we actually demand, we tell you, go get help. Right. And Depression think for yourself. Thing. Stop. Oh, I know what I was going to talk about. If you're in a religion that is controlling you by fear, get out of it. Right. Because if all you hear about is the negative things and how you're going to burn in hell if you do this, and you're going to burn in hell if you do that, and you're going to, your soul is going to be lost if you do this, and but. Fuck that shit. It's all fear tactics. Get out of it. Find something else that will that will feed your soul. Not right. something that, you know, because most religions, you spend your entire life preparing to die because you're afraid of going to hell. Yeah. So you never actually live your life. Right. You, there's so many things that you did, you've always wanted to do, but you never got to experience because it was a sin. Right. So screw all that shit. <laughs> that that was the thought that what kept fleeting away from me so <laughs> we don't need to put it in the notes but yeah so i guess to sum up things we talked about the fear culture in america today where it stems from um you know all the different factors involved in it we talked about ways to combat it we talked about the five second rule using an anchor thought and you know fact checking everything before you just believe it just because it fits what you believe should be true and that's the biggest problem is you know as americans we have so much pride that we can't admit when we're wrong right and i've been wrong many times in my life you know i got sucked into like i said got sucked into the fear propaganda from the last election cycle because i researched trump myself see i of course have never been wrong <laughs> but I may be wrong about that. <laughs> right. So, yeah. So that pretty much sums up our podcast of the day of fear culture. Fear culture. Just, yeah. Don't be, don't be afraid. Go Great. Live your life. Go yeah. yeah. You can't live if you're afraid. Yeah. The only way to live is just living. I'm going to ask that each and every one of you that listen here today, find something fun to do today. Yes. And you'll have a happier tomorrow. Yes. And, you know, as I, uh, with every video and stuff, if you liked it, give us a like, a subscribe, share it with your friends. If you don't yes. like it, share it with your enemies. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, and go to our website, The Bunny Rabbit's Hole, and you can find links to all of our social media and everything else that we have there. You can find us, hopefully you found us someplace because you listen to this. Uh, just give us a review. I don't something. care what you say. It doesn't matter what you say. Yeah, if there's something you want to hear us talk about, leave a comment below. If we like it, we'll talk about it. If we don't, we'll ignore it. Exactly. So, <laughs> if all right, you think I'm, we're full of shit, tell us that too. Yes. I love to hear that stuff. I love to hear that stuff. And if I said something wrong or Craig said something wrong, uh, say why you think we're wrong, and then we'll say why you're wrong, and then we'll just go back and forth like that for a while. That'd be fun. Right. <laughs> all right. So insert tagline here. All right. Peace, Peace out. out. Love you guys. <laughs>